about Labour's position on Brexit uh, and on the trade negotiations and their, their impact on peace and politics in Northern Ireland. On the 18th of November, the People's Transition Community-led Development for Climate Justice will have a guest speaker in Mary Robinson. And on the 23rd of November, uh, our task conversations with decision maker series continues uh, with Thonishta Leo Vragar. So three super events coming up in the next month. Uh, just to, before we start talking to the speakers then, I very much welcome uh, Minister for State, Joe O'Brien, um, who uh, has spent a lot of time and energy in developing uh, this panel. So uh, thank you, Minister, for joining us and he's going to open the event today. Minister, can you hear us? Like, I'll just need to check the mute button, please. Okay, we might be having uh, some technical difficulties just with uh, getting the uh, Minister of State Joe O'Brien in, so hopefully we'll get to talk to him as soon as possible. Uh, in the meantime, I think we might... Oh, there we are. Hello, Minister. Hello, Minister O'Brien. Can you hear us, Minister? You just might need to unmute yourself, Minister, yeah, please. Apologies, yeah. apologies for that. I don't, know, I don't know how long you were waiting there. To Not try at all. Uh, thank you thank for, you. for opening the event for us. Not at all. And look, thanks to everyone. and. Uh, Shall I kick off? I don't know how, how long you've been buying time there. Uh, we have we have about five minutes, please. Thank you. Okay, look, thanks to everyone. Thanks to Shauna. Thanks to Task for organizing today and inviting me um, to, to, to open this discussion about well-being indicators. And I suppose, look, for too long, um, we've relied on GDP um, as a measure of how well we're doing as a country and how well our citizens are doing. And for Ireland in particular, I think that's proved to be a very inaccurate tool and a, and a poor tool. Uh, there has been some modification of GDP, of course, in Ireland, but it still has its faults. And its main limitations remain that it is just a measure of money in the economy. Uh, it's not a measure of the distribution of the money. It's not a measure of who's getting most, who's getting least. Uh, and, and most importantly, it's not a measure of meaningful outcomes in people's lives. Uh, but I suppose this isn't just an Irish problem, and indeed many countries are well ahead of us in terms of addressing the shortcomings of GDP uh, by developing and using uh, well-being indicators. I'm not going to spend too much time um, outlining these different approaches and models, but I would like to thank and I suppose draw attention to uh, a short and useful publication by the Department of Finance that was launched uh, with Budget 2021 uh, that outlines examples of other national indicators uh, and OECD well-being indicators as well. And I suppose importantly for today, uh, uh, it's important to say, if it hasn't been said already, that there is a commitment in the programme for government to develop a set of wellbeing indicators to create, I suppose, a well-rounded and holistic view of how our society is faring. And it's significant, I think, that the Department of the Taoiseach will be, will be significantly involved in that work as well. Um, so to kind of step back, I mean, wellbeing indicators look at how we're doing in a much broader way than simply our economic performance. Uh, and in some respects, I think the pandemic has underlined for us the importance of particular areas in our lives that we generally do not measure uh, as a government. Social interactions, for example, are an area that the OECD measures, uh, but it also look, looks at health and housing, two of the big ones, but knowledge and skills, environmental quality, which is important uh, for me and my colleagues in the Green Party, uh, subjective well-being, safety in work, um, uh, and, and the work-life balance side of things as well. Um, and I think, speaking frankly, we, we can't really possibly begin to effectively tackle a lot of the challenges that we face as a society unless we have a full and true picture of where we stand. And the development of well-being indicators can help us to do this, I think. Um, like currently, we can, in a, in a fragmented way, uh, look at various reports, various data that will tell us about isolated sectors. But I think the beauty of well-being indicators, and especially how they've been communicated in other countries, is that they do try to pull many of these key areas into one snapshot. Um, and for me, potentially the most valuable aspect of the development of well-being indicators in Ireland is that 
I feel they can and they should uh, be used in decisions around allocation of resources and reallocation of resources. Uh, now, many of you would be familiar with the kind of attractive color-coded dashboards of other countries uh, that are used to display their well-being indicators. And these are very interesting and, in fact, very insightful as well. But frankly, in my view, it will be for naught unless indicators are used to tackle unequal outcomes for different groups of people. So well-being indicators could and should be a very useful tool in tackling inequality. Uh, and this is why it's important in my view that whatever indicators are developed and agreed on, that they are connected to a real mechanism that can address underperformance or inequality in a well-being outcome. So there is a job of work to do, obviously, in terms of uh, agreeing a set of metrics to, to measure what is important for individuals, families and communities within Irish society. And I think there needs to be wide and open consultation on this. Uh, and I think it's I think it's only fair, excuse me, if um, I declare some of my interest in this area, obviously as Minister for Community Development and Charities, I feel it's crucial that the community and voluntary sector are consulted in this regard, not just because I'm Minister for the area, but also the fact that there has been already a lot of bottom-up thinking and planning uh, done in this area, particularly by the public participation networks uh, all across the country. Each PPN is charged with developing a well-being statement at local authority or community level and many have actually uh, done so already uh, and I want to acknowledge um, the work of Social Justice Ireland, uh, the Environmental Pillar and others in developing the toolkit to help PPNs nationally uh, to develop well-being statements. Uh, um, to sum up I suppose a, a couple of other relevant points under my remit uh, within my own department here, the Social Inclusion Community Activation Programme, or SICAP, which will, many of you will know, um, attempts to move people along in life, I suppose, in a, in a holistic way. Uh, now, we did recognise previously that the quantitative sort of measurement that we were using to assess progress of people's uh, people's stories w was was had shortcomings. Uh, so we recently developed a tool called the My, Dur My Journey Distance Travel Tool, and this tool measures nuanced progress made towards agreed outcomes across domains like education, employment, but also personal development. And it attempts to demonstrate the progress that participants make along life's journey and well-being forms a big part of this. And, and finally, then, in terms of acknowledgement, I, I do want to acknowledge the work of Pavel as well, uh, and particularly Martin Quigley, who uh, put together a very interesting uh, discussion document on the area of well-being indicators as well. And I think Martin is going to have an input uh, in the session later today as well. I'll, I'll stop talking because I know I've slowed things down um, and, and let you start the start the debate and the conversation. And thank you very, very much again to TASC and for everyone involved today for, um, for, for participating. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that introduction. That was very helpful uh, and uh, sets the context for a lot of what's going to be talked about today. So moving on then, we're going to have uh, seven speakers who will have uh, five minutes each to, to talk about uh, well-being from uh, their perspective and, and their background, and then we'll have time for uh, questions and answers at the end. Uh, so first up on the panel, we have uh, Nessa Harrigan, the Green Spokesperson for Finance and Health, and who has a strong interest and background in creating sustainable communities. So thank you very much, Nessa. Hi everybody, um, and thank you for having me today. I'll speak fast, I do anyway, so I, I'm hoping I can get through the five minutes. Um, so Joe gave a really good introduction there and was very ministerial and I get to be a bit more um, Green Party orientated um, today. Uh, because this is an area, um, the inadequacy of GDP in terms of budget decision making has been something that we've we've talked about a lot, I guess, uh, in the party. Um, I've been going through, back through our manifestos, and obviously we had um, well-being indicators in our manifesto um, in you know January, February. It's appeared in the program for government and was cited in um, the the 2021 budget, and we're very happy about that. Um, in our 1989 manifesto, we say the following. Our main concern is to combat the importance placed on growth in the quality of goods produced with a new approach, which places the prime emphasis on growth in the quality of people's lives. We could sum up the case against growth economics as follows. Traditional methods of measurement do not distinguish between good and bad forms of growth. And I guess throughout our, our, our kind of political journey, that has been a, a kind of an underlying um, theme throughout. Um, and so I guess for us, 
well-being indicators are part of a larger story, um, which is about reorientating or taking a different perspective on, you know, our national approach to economics. And within that sits things like um, universal basic income, things like a system of public banking, um, a new system of social dialogue that recognizes the importance of things like unions, um, multi-annual funding for basic services and the provision of basic services universally, and then things like, you know, corporation tax reform and tax justice and transparency globally. All of those, are, you know, form a kind of a network or a tapestry of a new way of looking about at, you know, what are economics for, what are national economic plans for, um, and who are they meant to benefit? So I think from our perspective, one of the, 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 um, interesting things about well-being indicators is that it allows us to bring new focus to areas that traditionally haven't been um, uh, they um, haven't gotten enough focus during the budgetary um, process so joe obviously said there already that um, part of the genesis um, of our interest in this area is um, the environmental aspect and that's unsurprising from the green party um, we have been long term supporters of you know constitutional change to recognize the right to, the, to, to nature and um, we've also looked at mechanisms like a bill of rights for nature um, but I, I think it boils down to the idea that uh, our natural resources are something that should be um, safeguarded for this generation and the next um, and that current you know economic networks and structures don't always do that Another aspect, and, and I, I'm being selfish here, but it is a theme through my own kind of political journey, is um, a recognition of the caring economy. So uh, a recognition, I guess, that through demographics and um, through automation, you know, work will change into the future. There'll probably be less traditional work and more caring. Um, uh, as a former carer myself, we don't recognize those roles very well, and that has impacts on particular groups such as women. Um, and we see this as a vehicle towards, um, you know, amplifying that voice and amplifying those needs. Uh, another aspect to it, which I think is particularly interesting, and if you look at the New Zealand model, this is an area that, that I find exciting, is a recognition of things around kind of indigenous peoples and language. So obviously in Ireland, you know, we don't support or fund, uh, although we got quite good funding this year, but we don't generally support or fund um, our national language and um, it is in trouble. Uh, we also have, you know, traveler communities and other communities that that need those kind of supports and they're not always recognized. So that's um, an area of particular interest for us. And then I guess a, a final kind of key area that I, I would like to see um, focused on is youth and intergenerational justice. Um, again, Sometimes, and there's an argument around whether that's because, you know, who votes and how the voting system works, but a, a, an understanding that um, support for, for uh, young people and support for that idea of one generation to the next doesn't always get the, the attention that it should receive. Um, I think that, uh, and I'm mindful that I'm uh, nearly at the end of my five minutes, the, the issues that are particularly interesting and will be challenging for us in the next in the next year in, in trying to implement this are uh, the methodology where I, I can I, I'm not an expert in this area and I'm very happy to, to be on a call with people who are experts because I'm going to learn loads but the difference between objective and subjective um, metrics in well-being indicators would be really important to us and I think if we lose the subjective aspect we will have lost something very important um, Consultation and engagement, um, as, as cited there already, that there has been work done in the PPN networks around this, and that shouldn't be thrown out, and we should learn from that. Um, there is a huge area around, you know, digitization and the digital society, and can we harness that to have a kind of a dynamic process that, that is, you know, fully integrated into people's lives? Um, we are, are, having read around the issue, it seems to me that we have a good model uh, in the Citizens' Assembly for ensuring that we have representative um, engagement. The German, the German proposal here, um, even themselves, it, it's acknowledged that they didn't quite get that right and the methodology for how you engage with people is incredibly important here. And we would like to see it, um, in, you know, uh, informed by things like the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and then obviously for me, implementation in the political sphere. So I'm chair of the Budget Oversight Committee. Something like wellbeing indicators should be absolutely formative to the budgetary process. And in, in some ways, it should widen the budgetary process and somewhat depoliticize de it and bring in a larger cohort of people who have more say. Um, and then I guess the last thing I would say Having, having kind of worked on this a bit, is that uh, 
well-being indicators are not a one size fixes all. Um, even in, area, in you know, places like New Zealand or Iceland who have implemented them and it's very early days, there's a recognition that, that this won't fix everything. But what this will do is make a very narrow economic model wider, broader, and more inclusive for more people. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nasa. That was really good, especially in the, in the time frame. Um, and a lot of those issues will probably come up uh, later on again. Thank you very much for that. Uh, next up then, and, and Minister mentioned uh, Martin Quigley, um, the Director of Data Analytics with uh, Pobble. Uh, and he's also uh, responsible for overseeing the commissioning of the Pobble's HP Deprivation Index. So I might ask Martin to, to join us, please. Thanks, Martin. Great, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, yeah? Perfect. Brilliant. Uh, I will set my five minute timer uh, and try to try to stay within within time. It's it's certainly a challenge given given the uh, the breadth and and depth that that could be gone into in, in any area of, of uh, well being or, or uh, quality of, quality of life indices. So yeah, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me along to speak on this this hugely important uh, topic and and to be to be part of of the the, the national debate in the area. Uh, so yes, as you say, my name is Martin Quigley. I work in Hubble. Uh, we're an agency that acts on behalf of government, um, administering funds. So in, last year, in the re region of 750 million uh, across areas of of social inclusion, uh, inclusive employment, and uh, increasingly in 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 the area of early learning and care. So while Funding administration is, is primarily what we do. Um, our, our, our purpose, our why we do it, um, is, is to combat social exclusion, uh, to improve outcomes uh, for communities, families, individuals, and, and children. So it's for that reason that I suppose our interest slash our involvement uh, in the field of nationally agreed well-being and quality of life indicators is ultimately twofold uh, along each of those areas. So the, the first that, that I'll speak about briefly um, is in the area of, of social inclusion. And I suppose from our perspective, uh, just the, the desire to ensure that social inclusion, community cohesion and equality are, are at the heart of the construction of, of an index such as, such as this. And I suppose the fact that these principles uh, you know, have very real implications. As we know, what, what gets measured uh, gets done. So for, from a social inclusion perspective, I think it's worth noting, you know, things like uh, the fact that averages can, can, be quite, can be quite misleading. Averages may, may hide what the, the actual lived reality is for, for certain communities, certain groups uh, who, who may, be, may be missed or left behind if, if we're just looking at, at things like, like national trends or national averages. Um, so, so looking, for example, I suppose one, one example we would see is, is the likes of the, the Welsh model where, you know, they, they don't necessarily just look at, say, uh, average life expectancy. What, what actually gets measured is the difference between average life expectancy in the most affluent area and, and the, the most uh, deprived area, with, with one of the policy objectives being to reduce that, reduce that gap. Um, I, I, I could, could speak a little bit more about that area, and, and perhaps we'll have a chance to do so uh, during the, the Q&A, but I, I suspect other, other speakers may also touch on the importance of social inclusion and equality within uh, wellbeing index. So I'll jump on maybe to the second point from our perspective, which is coming from a funding organisation, I suppose the question of, of the, and the concept around utility of, of the index, and it's, it's been touched on by, uh, by Nessa already in relation to uh, you know, the, the impact and, and dovetailing with uh, the budgetary process. Um, and, and it is back to that question of, of what, are, what are the various purposes of, of the index? Is it, you know, is it gonna be purely around you know, the, the dashboard and reporting on national wellbeing? Or are we actually serious about embedding it within our systems so that policies, programs, resources, can be orientated uh, in a way and towards uh, the, the areas, the communities, the inv individuals uh, that, that need them the most. Um, so I suppose an example of that would be, would be our work within, within Pubble um, in terms of the, the generation and the application of resource allocation models or RAMs as we term them, uh, where, where very often we would use uh, data such as the Pubble HP Deprivation Index to identify the most disadvantaged communities in the country so that the funding allocated can be weighted in such a way that reflects that regional uh, or local uh, disparity in terms of, of affluence versus, versus deprivation. And you, we would use resource allocation Allocation models using that kind of data under, for example, SICAP, which, which uh, Minister O'Brien has referenced, uh, as well as Childcare Capital Leader, uh, the Department of Education and Skills used the Deprivation Index as part of their uh, identification of services under the DESH model. Um, so if, if one of the objectives of the index is to be able to leverage 
uh, this data and this information for for real programmatic and budgetary utility. Uh, you know, there are then things that we would need to consider in terms of the, the construction and the development of the index. So one of those would be the need to be able to break down information, say regionally. So for example, at, at the local authority area to be able to see these indicators by area so that from a national level, resources can be, uh, you know, can be weighted in, in one direction or another, but also equally and, and just as important and mentioned in some of the comments I see already, ensuring that information and data is available to local and regional policy actors, to, to you know, local community development committees, to, uh, you know, to, to LCDCs, to, to, to the PPM, uh, that that information about their area in terms of, of what's going well and what isn't uh, can be can be utilized at, at the regional at the local level uh, for, for that decision making and, and for for distribution of, of fixed sums of, uh, of, of of resources um and yeah so I suppose that was just one one important piece that 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 is important in terms of the, the construction of uh, of the index it does probably point to the need where possible as well to leverage and utilize existing national data sets, administrative data sets from across government departments and state agencies so that they can underpin uh, as where possible as many of these indicators as, as possible. And we're actually in a pretty good space, I think, for in, in terms of much of that as, as a starting point of that journey. Um, just given, I mean, we, we are at the top of the European leaderboard in terms of open data, so the, the routine publication of administrative data under open data license, we've been the top of the European leaderboard there for three years. Uh, the information that's on data.gov.ie is, you know, can, can certainly be leveraged for this kind of work. Um, but then, look, I suppose my, my time is up, my time has just gone off. So in, in summary, I suppose the main point we're making here is that in order to ensure that a model can generate calls to action in areas where we're not performing well, so both domains and geographic areas where we're not support, uh, performing well, we need to begin with that end in mind and ensure that the indicators aren't just measure, measurable, but are also actionable. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for that, Martin. Uh, very succinctly put. Thank you. Um, next up, then, we have related to the, uh, to the issue of measures and indicators is Damien Lennon, a statistician with the Central Statistics Office. And Damien would have been heavily involved in the CSO's well-being of a nation. Uh, thank you very much, Damien. No problem at all. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, yes, I'm going to speak, uh, as, as Michelle said, my name is, is Damien Lenahan. I'm a statistician in the Central Statistics Office based down in Cork. Um, and I'm going to talk about the development of our set of wellbeing indicators that we used in the Wellbeing of the Nation uh, 2017 publication. And I think a lot of it has been touched on. I suppose the impetus behind it has been touched on already. Um, I suppose we, we look at the, the Stiglitz report, and uh, I mean, not just the CSO, but generally the Stiglitz reports in 2009 as I suppose the, the real kind of moment of change, I suppose, where things move towards well-being and, and perhaps moved away from GDP. But I think it, it started long before that. I mean, Simon Kuznets, Kuznets who would have been uh, the Nobel laureate who de developed, uh, one of the main developers of national accounts, um, said the welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measure of national income. Um, so I think what he was saying there was that GDP, while an excellent measure of the size of, of an economy, it has its limitations in that it just measures the size of an economy and using it as a proxy as a proxy to measure well-being was an incorrect use of of that um of that measurement so suppose with that in mind we set about developing a set of um a set of well-being indicators and i was I, I led that project where i started from with that was i suppose we had to look at what were other countries doing you know what what was already um being done out there um and that involved, I suppose, maybe a year, 18 months of, of desktop research where I was looking at what other international bodies were doing. I looked at Statistics Canada and their index of, of well-being. I looked at the UK, um, the, what the ONS publications uh, that had been released there. I looked at Virginia Performs, a state in, in the US and, and other states in the US as well, but that's just one that comes to, to mind as, as well as uh, work that had been done in, in Australia work that was done by the OECD and work that was done closer to home as well um, by the National Economic and Social Council uh, in their Social Matters publication. When I collated a lot of the indicators there, I had a list of over 600 indicators. Now, what I found was that a lot of these indicators were coming at the same phenomena from different angles. And what I mean by that is that, let's say if you look at an unemployment rate, an unemployment rate maybe looked at from 15 to 24 in, in um, 
Virginia performs, for instance, but it might be 18 to 24, but you're still looking at the same phenomena. So I was able to condense a lot of those down to perhaps around 100 indicators before I went out to consult with other experts. And I think that consultation process was really important. I consulted with um, the Whitaker Institute in, in Galway, in the National University of Ireland, Galway, uh, led by um, Dr. Michael Hogan, but more broadly than Dr. Michael Hogan, because um, there was a whole department there. Uh, like there was um, the day I, the consultation session that I, I held with them involved educators, sociologists, economists, um, psychologists, uh, the, the whole the whole gamut really, I suppose. And, and that gave a broader perspective to us on what was important and, and what was, was less important, depending on, on what way you looked at it. Um, I also would have talked to the National Economic and Social Council to get their view on, on how they developed a set of indicators and to get their view on, on our set of indicators, along with the Department of Health. I, I worked with, with Maria Moans and the Department of Health, who would have been they would have been developing, I suppose, a similar, um, similar set of indicators, but more from a health perspective to support their, their, the Healthy Ireland program. Um, and I managed to get the, the list down to the 35 indicators that are that are in the release, um, and they're split across eight domains. So I suppose the indicators came first, and then they were split into the domains. I suppose the next challenge for us really was to decide on how were we going to disseminate this information or communicate this information because there's a wealth of information in 35 indicators. We we looked at a couple of different ways of doing it. We looked at creating an index, uh, and I suppose the the pro of an index is that it's simple. You have one figure, um, but um, a drawback of that is that a lot of the detail that that people really want from from um, well-being indicators is lost in an index. Um, like us with a dashboard is uh, is the, the methodology that we actually went and went with. While some of the simplicity is gone, where you're not just tracking one figure, um, the level of detail is is much greater. And I think some of some of the indicators when we look at them, you know, we, we looked at some economic indicators like average debt per household, some indicators related directly to work, um, like unemployment rate, I suppose, is the, the prime example there. Then we looked at some governance and equality metrics like female represent, representation in the doll, um, also things like quality of income distribution, um, and and other other areas like public safety, so, you know, sort of proportion of people that, that felt safe walking at night um, in their areas. So I, I, I know my, my five minutes is up there, but I suppose future steps for us will be transferring that into a more... Um, user-friendly and uh, user-interactive uh, dashboard, much like our, our macroeconomic, key macroeconomic indicators dashboard that, that's on our website. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there because I'm, I'm sure there, there may be maybe questions and I, I want to keep, keep things moving here. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, for Damien, for that. And I'm sure we'll come back to some of those things you mentioned later about the, the indicators. Um, next up, we have uh, Senator Alice Mary Higgins, who leads the Civil Engagement Group uh, in the Shannon and is also a member of the Committee on the uh, Climate Action and on Employment Affairs and Social Protection. Thank you very much, Senator. Myself. Hi, um, thank you very much. And uh, it's already a really, really interesting discussion. Um, I had a load of things I want to say, and then I heard the last two discussions around indicators, and I, I had a whole different set of comments I would want to make. But uh, I do think in terms of indicators, I think it's really important that, that we don't see ourselves as having shrunk now down to 35 and narrowing further, because I think, in fact, it is important that that is an, a widening conversation, that it's still open. And for example, we know there's over 160 indicators in relation to the sustainable development goals, and it will be crucial. Those are things Ireland needs to measure anyway, that those are part of how we're measuring well-being. I think they're really important. Again, the, the sustainable development goals might not be the limit of how we measure national well-being, but they certainly should be part of that. Um, other things in terms of what gets measured, I, I've noted in different countries, there's different things that are, are really positive. One of the things that's interesting is how time is measured. I know there is some measurement of time use in Ireland, but something that I know has been done very interestingly, actually at civic level in different countries, is around time poverty. So it's not just simply around, but you know, what time you have, because we know in previous work around that idea of measuring multidimensional poverty, that time poverty and income poverty tend to inter intersect as well. 
So I think those are really important factors. Um, I think it's really important that we don't fall into a space of um, just the snapshot. And actually a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is, is time. So that we don't simply fall into a purely distributional mechanism where we're simply looking at the distribution of resources in any average year, but that we have that kind of space uh, that I know the local PPNs have been doing in terms of their well-being indicators, where they're looking at well-being in terms of this generation and the next generation. And I think that's really important that they're able to measure cumulative progress towards, and it's again, somewhat of what the minister had said around that distance traveled as well, so that we, we, we make sure we don't just simply maybe expand our household reporting, but that we actually look to that community. And again, I found it interesting that there were measures in terms of safety, but that we haven't really looked yet at measuring participation in the fullest sense and those kind of social indicators. And it's really interesting now because with COVID, we know and we've seen that basically people connecting, people being well, people feeling safe, like these are what make people feel um, well and make people feel that they're, they're okay. So those, those are important things. Um, what I, I wanted to talk about particularly, I think, is um, uh, I, again, first of all, that I'm really glad that this is a whole direction we're traveling. Of course, GDP doesn't capture things. I thought it was really interesting in the Canadian model. I was looking at theirs where uh, in one of the culminative pieces, there was a 38% increase uh, in GDP, which was only a 9% increase on the well-being indicators. And that really shows us how skewed your measures can be uh, when we were just focusing on, on GDP or GNI+. Plus. Um, but perhaps what I wanted to kind of focus on, and it was interesting, it was in the description of this event, the question of measurement, which is endlessly fascinating and is a longer process, but then how do we incorporate these into, this into the outcomes that we're aiming for in public policy? And this is something that I think is crucial, and it's a learning in relation to, um, we had commitments, it's something I would have worked on myself in the Women's Council, on gender and equality proofing of budgets in the last Oireachtas. But what we saw was it did begin to happen, but by the third year, we were beginning to measure some things. And, and absolutely, there was excellent officials who were working on it. But what we needed from the beginning, what really matters if we're having well-being budgets, if we're making well-being our focus, is that indicator, is, is that we're not just measuring how it worked out on well-being, and others have said this, but that we're aiming for well-being. So that we're not just looking at the targets, but we're changing the direction of the bow, we're changing the aim. And we know that there's a lot of unconscious and hidden assumptions in a lot of our economic and financial decision making mechanisms. I mean, trickle down, though it's been disproved everywhere, still certainly features in some of the narrative we hear about boosting different sections of the economy in the hope that there will be a, an effect down the line. So there's a lot of kind of unchallenged assumptions at work. And I think we really need to be making those statements at the beginning that from next year, this is a budget that shows that it is aimed at well-being. And again, the Scottish model is really interesting because they have an equality statement which accompanies the budget on the same day. So it's not simply measuring a little bit further down the line how that worked out for equality, but it's saying, this is why we made this decision, this is why we made that decision. And it shows that the aim is well-being. I think that's going to be a really important test. And the reason, again, I'm coming to time, uh, the reason I think that that's important is in terms of time, we're not in a, a, a stationary environment. We are in an environment where, for example, next year, the fiscal rules um, have been suspended this year and next year on a European context. So if we have measures that, that we believe are going to lead to really good well-being outcomes, next year we will have a lot more freedom to trial and to do those measures. So I think it'll be really important that um, we don't just see a piloting of well-being next year, but that we see next year as a big leap, next, you know, budget 2022, as a big leap forward in the use and orientation towards well-being outcomes. And I think there's, there's really good potential for that. And there are great measures already there, as I said, in the SDGs, in some of the measures that were put in place around equality and gender proofing. Um, NASA mentioned care, and I think care is going to be really fundamental. And I, I keep coming into time in a way. That's that time poverty piece again. Care, I think, will be a key outcome. So there's a real opportunity there. And maybe I, I, some of the things I liked just last year is the cost benefit tool. 
So again, I know this is something that's been used in New Zealand. And again, it's translating those goals into a real outcome. So I'm just, am I, is that my beep? I'm not sure of time. Into real outcomes is cost benefit and policy. So that if you actually have cost benefit that factors in well-being and factors in well-being outcomes, that makes a real difference in terms of when you talk about benefits. So it's on those tools. And I think, for example, this is a mistake that was made in the early work on equality budgeting, which has now been, they've begun to rectify in Scotland and elsewhere, where they focused on expenditure, but not on taxation and tax expenditure. So it's a really interesting thing they found there is that if you're applying a well-being test, it's not just simply through the Department of Social Protection or Health, for example, but that you look, for example, at tax reliefs and say, what are the relative well-being or non-well-being outcomes of various tax measures that we might make or tax reliefs that we choose to give to different sectors? So I think that we're at an exciting time. I think there is an international context which is encouraging different thinking. I think we have an EU context which is given the space for very transformative approaches to budgeting. And I'm really delighted that we have a government that are, you know, space, you know, and, and indeed Nessa with oversight of the budgetary process in her committee who are really trying to orient this way. But I think we do need to seize it as a moment and make sure this doesn't become a kind of peripheral experiment, but that it's, it's an orientation. And lastly, very final point, again, the PPNs, the local levels, it's really important that that well-being is factored in um, to resource allocation, but that also means giving more power at local level around resource allocation. That has to be accompanied by that so that, so that the, the understandings and insight that those kind of local groups and local wellbeing work um, are, are generating, um, that that can be matched and that good faith is kept by ensuring resources. And, and again, that the local development plans um, are able to deliver uh, on the places where local people themselves are identifying uh, a, a, an intersection. And again, uh, the environmental and social factors to my mind are just deeply entwined in this. Thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, Senator, for that. Thank you. Uh, next up on the panel, we have uh, Jennifer Wallace, who's head of policy at Carnegie UK Trust. And uh, Jennifer has been heavily involved in examining uh, international practices with regard to the development of wellbeing frameworks. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon um, and greetings from Central Scotland. Um, I hope you're all well and it's, it's a pleasure to be with you virtually for this event. Um, as Michelle said, I've been working now at the Carnegie Trust for almost a decade on concepts of well-being um, with the What Works for Wellbeing Centre, which is based in London, um, with the Scottish Government, Welsh Government, some work with Northern Irish Executive um, and internationally with the OECD. Um, and, and normally um, when I do these kind of presentations, I spend a chunk of time explaining what I mean by well-being, um, but I'm not going to do that this afternoon, um, partly because I've only got five minutes um, and partly because I think there's actually a far more interesting question um, that should probably engage our attentions first, which is what do you mean by framework? Um, because we have delved into the conversation here quite deeply in terms of what the indicators are. But the indicators themselves are just measures and proxies for something. So when we talk about a well-being framework, what we're really getting at in terms of the international community interested in well-being is that there's something wrong with the way that we currently structure our services, our decisions and our economies. And that we need a different framing for that. And well-being economies or well-being or societal well-being um, aligned to sustainable development goals is what we mean by a different type of framing. And in that, at its core, it's talking about rebalancing social, economic and environmental um, and pulling those things together into more of a, a coherent balance across our society. And I think it was Senator Higgins that mentioned the uh, the issues with trickle down economics. Um, and that's absolutely what is in the, the firing line of the work on well-being. Um, but we need to change our structures in order to do that effectively. So when we look at wellbeing frameworks around the world, we don't just see dashboards, um, and actually we don't include the ONS dashboard uh, on wellbeing as a wellbeing framework. 
we look at systems where it is far more integrated into the activity of government. And a wellbeing framework usually includes a statement of intent, uh, a statement that um, quite often I sum up as the Mars approach to delivering government. Uh, we want a good society where you can work, rest and play. Um, it then has a series of outcomes, um, and those are the outcomes that you most often see aligned to the sustainable development goals. We want a healthy society, we want a fair society, we want a greener society. They're quite often aspirational in their language um, about the kind of society that we all want to live in. And it's those that then determine what the indicators are underneath them. So, for example, if you wanted a society where there was gender equality as one of your outcomes, you would then follow that through into a series of indicators about gender equality. And it's that filtering through that matters. The indicators themselves from a wellbeing framework point of view are really only proxies. Um, they're proxies for whether you're on the right track to delivering the wellbeing outcomes. And the risk is if you focus too much just on the indicators themselves, that you open the system up to exactly the kind of perverted um, incentives and gaming behavior that GDP and other activities currently experience. So there's a very solid reason for thinking about it in that way. Um, now, several people have commented on the number of other governments that are doing this. So a couple of things to note. Um, we know Scotland and Wales have legislation um, that embeds this approach. Uh, New Zealand has slightly different legislation, Iceland's also an innovator. Those four nations all come together in the we, we Gov Alliance, so the Wellbeing Economy Government Alliance, um, which has its home in, in Scotland. Um, and those governments are experimenting with what it means. What I think is really interesting about that is that they're all small governments. And I think the fact that they're small governments, by that I mean governments of small populations, um, so five million or less, what I mean by that is that there's something that tells us about the level at which well-being operates well um, and where it can actually provide that structural framing for how you think about social progress. And when you start unpacking that, it tells you a lot more about what well-being is doing to the system rather than just what you can do with the indicators themselves. So one of the things that we think well-being does is it helps to show, to, to show up where you can make joins in public policy. So rather than seeing things through silos and looking at just your subset of the economy or your bit of the environment or health versus education versus social security, you begin to see things in a holistic framework and look for the joins. And it also helps to spot who is falling through the cracks. Because the way that we tend to think about our societies is that we put people in boxes, and certainly our social indicators put people in boxes. But once you start looking at them from a well being lens, it becomes unavoidable to notice that the people who experience poor environmental quality also experience poor economic indicators, also experience difficult health and, and other social indicators. And the question then becomes what do you do for the people who are falling through the cracks, not what do you do for the service that is set up? to help them and that fundamentally changes the nature of the conversation that you have about well-being in society and those are the types of things that we've observed happening in the other governments um, around the around the world that experiment with this a couple of points um to say very much it's an emergent area of work. Some of us, myself included, think that what we're actually seeing is the next step of uh, new public management. So if we see new public management and trickle down economics have uh, failed or at least have diminishing returns, then we think this is the next big model um, but it's very much at the uh, sort of innovative end of it so for those who are experimenting with it it feels unsure and lonely and that's why things like the work that the OECD does to bring together uh, countries experimenting with it and the We All Alliance really really matter so people don't feel quite so lonely in, in that journey and the other piece that I would say is that balance between and we've talked about it a little bit today the balance between the democratic and the technocratic so there there is a technocratic answer about the best way to measure gender equality. There is a best way to measure educational outcomes in Ireland. I can't tell you what those are, but experts such as Damien and Martin would be able to, to help with that. The question of whether or not 
gender equality or race equality or environmental outcomes, the question of whether those matter most to people, whether those are the outcomes that you seek, those are the democratic questions. And that's where citizen voice and participation comes in. And in the ideal system, what you want is a way of building those in together. So they're not in conflict with each other, but they both understand what they bring to the conversation about developing well-being. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jennifer. You hit on a lot of points that I could see a lot of people uh, nodding heads in agreement about the uh, intersectionality, if you like, of, uh, of issues for people. And um, thank you for that. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Peter Doran from the School of Law in Queen's University of Belfast. And uh, Dr. Doran was joint governor of the High Level Roundtable on work um, on well-being in Northern Ireland. And he's spokesperson for the Wellbeing Econ Economy Alliance in Northern Ireland. So thank you very much, Peter, for joining us. Thank you very much, and uh, it's great to, to join you in this uh, conversation. Um, I was delighted to, to work with Jennifer um, a few years ago on the uh, a very rich conversation, a multi-stakeholder uh, conversation with uh, some of the political parties, senior civil servants and other stakeholders from academia and NGOs that resulted in the development of a a societal well-being framework and indicators that was uh, really the, the basis for the design of the programme for government in Northern Ireland in 2015. And with the restoration of the uh, institutions um, in the new decade, new approach document, uh, there was a reaffirmation um, to pursuing that work and that uh, focus for the organisation of the, the new PFG here in uh, Northern Ireland. So it's, it's an area where I'm delighted to say that uh, those of us who've worked in this area in uh, the North um, may be able to share some of our experience. And uh, a lot of what Jennifer uh, said um, reflects and will be reflected in some of the comments um, that I'd like to make as well. I've organized my, my comments around some of the questions that were circulated. So, you wanted to address what does well-being mean and uh, what values might be reflected. But as Jennifer said, it's it's uh, I think it's important to keep our eyes on the framing, um, also the framework, and within the the, the well-being economy alliance, we focus on the narrative, the big narrative. I think if we're to really um, embed the conversation and keep an eye on where this conversation has emerged from, both in terms of the, the structural changes that are underway in the economy, the need to re-embed the uh, economic considerations within the, the constraints of the planetary boundaries. If we are going to address well-being, we need to keep an eye on where the conversation is coming from where the pressures, the constraints, and the opportunities are emerging. And that's all about a new narrative. And it's, it's a, a global narrative, but intensely local in terms of implementation. So one example um, of uh, a definition might be, if you, if you were to foreground this as an, an economic transformation or transfer, transformational agenda, you might say that a well-being economy is one that delivers social justice, brackets, placing human flourishing before the manufactured wants and desires, close brackets, while taking account of our planetary boundaries. We're in a moment in the conversation where very good global empirical data around the uh, ecological constraints or thresholds is available. And I believe that every national and local uh, attempt to measure well-being must take account of that uh, globally available data. There are nine critical thresholds, and we've gone through some of them already, including biodiversity and climate change. How could we possibly um, convene a conversation around well-being that doesn't take account of the implications of those very important constraints? Two additional points 
when we're designing a well-being economy at this point in time, um, we'll have to take account of what's been coined or termed the, the new normal and uh, the learning from the pandemic, um, a pandemic that could be with us for, for some time. Um, COVID-19 has been uniquely disruptive because it has challenged a fundamental institution of capitalism, that is the, the labour market. So it's forcibly reorganising how and where and what sort of work can be performed. So issues such as the quality of jobs, the quality of work, the adaptability of work, the location of work, access to work, all of these issues will um, come into play. Just on the idea of uh, the, 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 the of well-being, what is well-being? In terms of keeping an eye on why we're asking this question, I think it's also important to acknowledge and uh, right away that it's a deeply contested idea. We have to think about attempts to define it within the context of competing visions of political economy. Um, so it's important to focus on why we're engaging in this conversation and to be very careful about the existing power structures uh, behind the direction of travel that we're already engaged in when it comes to economic and political priorities. One version of the story behind the rise of well-being as a government concern has been told to us already by Will Davies in his book, The Happiness Industry, and I, I recommend it, how the government and big business sold us well-being. Capitalists and their economists have always been concerned with quantifying inputs, outputs, and the transaction costs, including some of the externalities. In the 1990s, this gave rise to the invention of a, a discipline called happiness economics. So it's useful to remember that part of the history of the well-being movement is a government-led attempt to quantify and manage the intangible economic resources, things like mental capital, happiness, and well-being. But well-being defined in this context is very much associated with optimizing productivity within a conventional capitalist and neoliberal political economy. So the risk for progressive actors, and some of them are, are convening and, and uh, uh, participating today, including the Green Party, labor organizations, the anti-poverty uh, agenda, those who are interested in inequality. The, the, the risk for us is that we end up adopting a well-being approach or narrative designed merely to manage the externalities of a broken economic system, notably the unhappiness and other symptoms produced by conventional forms of economic growth, consumerism, and hyper-individualism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that and um, for um, bringing us back to questions about, you know, why we're looking at this in the first place and where we're starting from as well as where we're going. So thank you very much for that. And our last speaker is Paul Gimmel, uh, Director of the European of the European Anti-Poverty Network. Uh, and Paul also uh, coordinates the community platform. So thank you very much, Paul, for, for waiting till the end. Thank you very much. Um, and one of the benefits or disadvantages of being at the end is more or less everything has, has it kind of been said. So, um, but just in terms of um, some of the main points that have been said, I think the last few points in terms of the narrative or the framing, the whole role of the debate, I think is, is extremely important as, a, as a, a key place to start in terms of developing a well-being framework. Um, all the benefits that kind of been outlined already uh, of a well-being framework over our current way of measuring progress. Um, and key is the balance between integrated approach to economic, social and environmental goals and values and policy and how they work together in an integrated way in terms of bringing about progress. So the sustainable development goals, that framework has already been mentioned as an important maybe starting point in, in looking at this. Uh, so they, in terms of the framing, but also the goals, but within that also, I think key has been the overall principle that um, the further is behind first and leaving no one behind is a key part of that framework as well and should be also key in terms of developing the, the well-being framework. Um, the important terms of the framework is the what's the added value of it. So it's not just about gathering information that's very interesting to read, 
but as people have said that it also is about then the policy response so how is that framework le leading to strategies to address issues around poverty for example or gender inequality housing and so on and what are the benchmarks what are the starting points what are our targets and has been mentioned in relation to the direction of, tar of travel uh, how do we know we're making progress and moving towards the objectives we're setting as well as key um, but also then what are the implications of not making progress or of going backwards uh, and of, that's often been the case in reality but a lot of strategies there don't address that but there's no no implications of what happens if we're not really making progress on this area um, also another thing that's already in place but not really working quite well is the issue of proofing so uh, whether it's poverty proofing or, or environmental or equality proofing uh, this is extremely important and one of the advantages of an integrated approach such as this means that we're we're looking at the impact of economic social and environmental policy on each other in an integrated way that was mentioned already as well uh, so how is economic policy uh, impacting on social policy or social progress and other indicators in terms of the, how we're moving forward or on environmental progress and so on so looking at these in an integrated way i think is important within within this framework as well um, the issue of quality, as you mentioned as well, so whether it's in relation to income, looking at income and wealth inequality, uh, services, uh, employment issues, the issue of quality of those is extremely important, as it is in terms of participation or democracy and who, who's involved in that and how are people able to engage in the decision making structures that we have in place as well. Uh, already, as, as is obviously very key, as I mentioned, in terms of leaving no one behind, the, use of overall averages is, not, is kind of useful, interesting at some stage, but it doesn't really address how we look at inequality and understand inequality. So how different areas and um, different community groups in our society benefit or don't benefit in relation to housing or health or education, other parts of income within our society, extremely important. So if we're developing indicators and measures, it has to really dig down in terms of understanding that inequality and looking at how then we develop measures in terms of addressing it and moving forward. And also what's been mentioned earlier, which is kind of key is outcomes. So inputs and provision access is extremely important, but really what's the, what's the provision the important in terms of outcomes? Uh, and earlier on as well, it was mentioned in terms of say health inequality or life expectancy. So how do we ensure we're, we're bridging that gap between the life expectancy of those from a lower income uh, communities compared to higher income background, people from higher income backgrounds, including traveler community and other minority communities as well within our society. How are we measuring and how are we looking at those as well? Uh, just in terms of the process for developing it and participation, that's extremely important to ensure that we engage with the most marginalized communities in, develop, in developing this framework. The PPNs have been mentioned and that framework has already been mentioned. But that's extremely important in terms of how we develop and progress and implement this, as is the resourcing of those communities. I just saw a, a comment coming up in the chat in relation to resourcing uh, community development. And that's something that's not really been uh, prioritized uh, in the last good number of years. And there's been a de-resourcing of communities, very disadvantaged communities in terms of the type of voice they can have in impacting and influencing decisions that impact on their lives. And that means to be resourcing that recognizes the need for those communities to have an autonomous voice um, and that's something that needs resourcing and supporting and implementing this process and um, maybe just in terms of time the um, last couple of points that there are a lot of data gaps I've been mentioned and these need to be looked at as well whether that's subjective or objective data I think both have very much value in relation to this and how we move forward uh, but we need to understand the where, the, where there are gaps in terms of what I mentioned, in terms of looking at inequality in particular and how we, how we address those. So I'll uh, just leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for that. Um, a, a number of really important points about uh, resourcing and data gaps as well. Um, so we have some uh, time for questions um, and I might just um, take some of those questions that have, have come up uh, before the, the panel started from, from the audience and, and during, uh, during the session. Um, a, a number of, of common themes have come up in terms of things like a democratic voice uh, uh, from disadvantaged communities or hard to reach communities, uh, especially now in terms of, of COVID. Um, and a number of people have commented in the, in the chat uh, about the um, public participation networks, as have a number of the panelists. 
Um, and I'm uh, wondering about people's ex the panel's experience of the PPNs, and they've already developed at a local level uh, well-being statements uh, and a vision for their local areas. And how can one of the questions is well, how can the work already done there uh, fall into a, a bigger conversation or national uh, vision for uh, a well-being framework? Peter, would you have any experience of the, the PPNs? Yes, I, I was involved in the earliest stages of the uh, the, the conversations um, around the uh, PPNs, and there, I understand that after their pilot programs, that that uh, project is now to be rolled out to all of the uh, the, the local partnerships. So they are, I, I think, a, a natural vehicle uh, that I would hope the government would use to roll out the conversation. Um, one of the points that, uh, um, well, but actually part of our experience in Northern Ireland um, was that it, it, it made sense to involve and engage local government and the, our own partnership processes. And uh, as Jennifer will tell you, some well-being uh, exercises and uh, programs were developed on the back of the, the work that we did at the executive level. Um, so I, th I think it makes sense if you're going to have an inclusive, meaningful conversation, um, everything is delivered locally. So the local partnerships have to be involved. And of course, the courts are now well rehearsed in some of the key issues that we've raised today. Thanks for that, Fisher. Um, anyone else want to come in there? Senator Higgins, have you experienced the PPNs? Uh, yeah, I think... Um... One thing that's really interesting, a lot of I, I have done some uh, just workshops through the Irish Environmental Network with PPNs around the Sustainable Development Goals, and I know that a lot of the same uh, participation networks that are basically been drawing up these kind of well-being indicators that they're also they are very much tying them into the Sustainable Development Goals as well, and I think there's a, an opportunity now where. In the program for government there's this commitment that the new local development plans the new county and city development plans are meant to have this dimension of the sustainable development goals but it is around translating that into something incredibly meaningful at local level and i think the same thing goes for well-being i think this is why uh, there's a natural overlap as i say the sustainable development goals don't set the limit of a local imagination around well-being but they certainly provide, I think, a really good core for that. And um, again, it's things like, you know, what does looking to the SDG, you know, what does life underwater mean in terms of your town? And it might be around the river, around the usage of the river. When we talk about planetary boundaries and it seems quite wide, it might be around literally the natural resources in a particular area, the community resources, the social needs. And I noticed I saw a couple of people saying, things are quite different that they've been looking at but i think there is a connection between those objectives which again it's that big picture that people keep saying of you know that the economy is something that sits inside society that sits inside an environment and translating that to local level so i think it's really important that the really good ideas that are coming out through ppns in terms of well-being and in terms of information of the SDGs, that that is matched with resources, because there's a real opportunity for the next set of development plans for all of those to be uh, informed in a completely new and, and, and exciting way by that process of participation. That, um, Senator, uh, one of the other areas that's come up uh, quite a bit is, is in terms of the need for whatever is developed is translated into policy making. Um, and this is an important issue, obviously, otherwise, as I think uh, has been revealed by Jennifer's work at Carnegie, that you can have frameworks and indications developed in other countries, but they, they may not necessarily actually be used sometimes in, in policy making. So just on that, I might ask Martin first, uh, given your experience of the uh, deprivation index, about what is it that uh, what are the factors that facilitate it being used properly to feed into decision making? Um, certainly, uh, uh, well, I think in respect of the the deprivation index, um, yeah, th th there's probably a number of, of, of elements that, that have, have been key to, to really getting it to the point where 
you know, where, where it is widely regarded as being the, the, the primary social gradient tool uh, in, in the state for, for resource allocation modeling and, and for, for resourcing purposes. Um, like the, the, and I, I could probably go on for, for a while about the construction of the deprivation index, which, which I'm sure uh, most of you uh, probably don't want to hear. Um, but the, the deprivation index itself, I, th I think key to its success is that it is based on quite a, you know, a, a, a sociologically robust and, and indeed profound, you know, understanding and comprehension of what deprivation is in the first instance. You know, it, it's, it's not just looking at, at uh, simple measures, say, of, of um, you know, of, of, of perhaps household income or, you know, it's quite multidimensional in its, in its construction. It, it looks at, I suppose in, in lay terms, it, it looks at what, what an individual has, who an individual is and where an individual lives. And then at, at, at kind of the local level, it pulls together this composite score, uh, which I think one of the major successes of it, of it is if you go to Pubble, uh, to, and sorry, this isn't a plug, but go to maps.pubble.ie and have a look at your area you know, there's something intuitive about how it, it you know, it, it demonstrates, uh, you know, to, to quite a small level uh, where areas are, are, are deprived and where areas are affluent and just, you know, mo the vast majority of people just using their, their local understanding of an area will, will, will see and it will make sense that one area is, is more red or more blue than, than the other in terms of disadvantage or, uh, or, or affluence. So I think key to it has been you know, in the first instance, it's face validity of making it public, making it accessible for everybody to see. If anybody has questions about it, they, they can use the, the, the interactive map and element of it. So there's not the, there's no cloak behind which it's it's hidden. So I think a, a key element has been in making it public and, and accessible to quite a, a small degree in terms of, of at the, the small area levels, that's about 90 households um, is, is the degree which it's, it's publicly available. So that, that's certainly been, been important. And then I think also the, the, the fact that when you drill into it, it's based on this quite complex, quite complex multidimensional understanding of what deprivation is. So with, with, with that in place, you know, that, that's really allowed us then to actually translate that from each area in the country, and again, quite a granular level, each 90 households or so having their own score, which actually means for, for the likes of, of our colleagues, you know, uh, say in, in, in PPNs or working in local community development, that they can, you know, again, see which areas r require, uh, you know, are, are characterized as the highest disadvantage, you know, even within that looking at specific measures such as where are lone parents, where are the highest pockets of, of unemployed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so useful at both both the local level, but then also being able to translate that back to things like national programs to be able to orientate, um, you know, resources under the likes of the social inclusion uh, community activation program, SICAP, being able to use the deprivation index as one of the measures that we look at when, uh, you know, when, when doing appraisals for, uh, for, for capital grants under in the in the area of childcare, uh, you know it was it was used in the original allocation of funding under under leader, and I think possibly the, the one that people would most commonly associate it with would be how the, the Department of Education and Skills have used it uh, as part of their mechanism for identifying schools that are uh, included under under the Dash model. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of how do we get to the point where it was quite well used, it was around being able to quite sim simply explain it, uh, being able to give that face validity of the fact that it makes sense to people, um, having it open to the public, and, and then also having it very usable from a policy perspective. So I suppose we had a, a number of people who would have been kind of trained up in how you can actually translate the data to what we term a resource allocation model. So that was quite important for, for, for when, you know, when say a government department or, um, you know, an agency would look and say, ask the question of how can we use this for, for resource allocation that there, there was some supports there to be able to do that. Thanks, Martin. And Senator Higgins, you want to come in there? Yeah, just a couple of comments. I think, um, it, Martin spoke very well there about the deprivation index and, and it, that is going to be the test on the well-being measures is that they can be used for resource allocation, that they can be, be usable. Um, but I just maybe a couple of comments in terms of the deprivation index was good, but it, in terms of where it maybe should have, the extra places it could go. Um, the deprivation index, one reason that I think it's really important is because Ireland's only, I think, twice had a national survey on wealth, partly because very small numbers of wealthy people tend to be statistically insignificant numbers in terms of the numbers you can get to reply to a survey. So we tend to not often have an actual measurement of wealth, but deprivation is the measurement of the absence of wealth. It doesn't just capture people who have, low, have less income, but people who don't have reserves, who don't have capital, who don't have 
other forms of wealth that allow them to, to access the things they need. So I think it is almost a reverse wealth measurement in a way. Um, and I think it's really important. It captures, it's interesting, the deprivation can often caption more than just uh, income measures. Um, but two places that I feel maybe were always the next step on deprivation that never maybe quite have happened yet. One was around um, that minimum essential standards of living, which is almost the reverse. That's that positive thing, not just what is deprivation, but what do you need in order to live well? And we know the Vincentian Partnership did great research and the living wage proposals were informed by that. But I was interested, I saw in the, the proposal from Minister McGrath, you know, and in some of the early that that living wage still isn't quite in there in, in some of the early indicators that have been looked at potentially around well-being. And I think that minimum essential standard of living, living wage is crucial. And then the other thing is that community deprivation. So not just household deprivation, but if you're a community that doesn't have access to a sports field or that doesn't have access to a shared public space or that, you know, those kinds of measures. And I think, so I think there's some interesting places for the deprivation index maybe to go. <laughs> That was just uh, my, my own comment. Thank you for that, Senator. And, and following up with that then, obviously, in terms of the development of a, a national uh, framework, um, there's an issue about, well, as, as Peter Doran had mentioned here, about, well, what does well-being mean uh, in a particular system? And, and, and the PPNs are very much at a local level. But in terms of the ownership and development of a framework at national level, um, who should be pursuing that and who should be taking ownership of that. So, uh, Nessa Horrigan, I, I might bring you in here about your thoughts about, you know, who should be responsible for uh, for taking forward a, a national wellbeing framework. Well, I, I think, you know, that kind of gets to the heart of it. And if we don't get that right at the very beginning of the process, we could find ourselves, you know, undertaking a huge amount of work and then not seeing the payoff in, in, in terms of, you know, reorientating our, our approach to economy. Um, I know in, in the New Zealand context, it, it was situated in kind of finance. Um, and there is an argument to say, well, look, that's where the real decision making ends up being, whether you like it or not, and be a pragmatist and, and situated there. However, I, I do think there's a, you know, a corresponding danger there that, um, ultimately you're quantifying everything in monetary terms and and in a way that's what we're trying to get away from um i, I think that you know previous speakers have talked about those networks of power and it's really important so you know at that granular you know community level and the 90 households it's so un important that we understand the detail there and the real lived experience of people but the colliery of that on the other side is that we have power structures at the you know at the macro level that can bring in that detail and then make strategic decisions around it and um just from from at the moment the budgetary oversight committee is answering a doll instruction around what work do they do because it's only set up since 2016 and the reason it was set up in 2016 is because the oecd sa said that we do this really badly we don't we don't check what we're spending we don't look at the budgetary decisions that we're making and we're you know we're we're not doing well in that area um and i think that in my very short time here, <laughs> I've realized that um, there's work to be done in integration of those kind of that that kind of macro decision making that you don't necessarily have every every committee seems to work as a silo every every um, department seems to be working as a silo and there isn't a huge amount of integration where people come around the table and say well you know th this is what this particular group needs or this particular department the example would be let's say in the Netherlands budgetary oversight is actually uh, staffed by all the chairs of all the other committees from like education from social protection and we don't do that here so I think where where we're correct in saying that there's a huge amount of data out there in Ireland about like uh, you know that we could draw on to do this work and there's a huge interest in the community to to you know focus and participate in this kind of work there has to be the, the other side of it which is about harnessing it in a in a in a macro way in a big you know a big vision way and if we don't get that right and we don't situate that decision making correctly then um then then you know we might not get what we want out of it and and uh, I, i'm not entirely sure that that should be in finance or deeper thank you paul did you want to come in there Yeah, I think that the issue of um, integrated approach in terms of policy and moving from data collection to kind of policy decision making is extremely key in relation to this. 
Um, even in relation to poverty and social exclusion, at this point, there is data being collected in terms of poverty, poverty statistics, but trying to look at that in terms of, like you were saying, what happens when you're not going the right direction in terms of your data? What's the implications of that? And sometimes there's no real link often between data and, and policy change. Uh, and that's something we struggle with, is uh, we have a poverty target on the one end, and then you have different measures, policy measures, but sometimes they're not really connected to each other. I think Alice Mary earlier on mentioned is important in terms of, let's say, income, in income inadequacy is a major issue. Uh, and we have the data in terms of what's needed for a living wage and for a minimum standard standard of living. Uh, but they're not brought into the frame in terms of decision making, in terms of policy make, making. So, like we would be advocating that the minimum essential standard of living be used as a benchmark for what is ad an adequate income. And it's, it's very detailed. It, yeah, it's easily uh, to, to work with in terms of policy making. So, I think sometimes we need to connect very much up the data we're collecting with the decision making. Uh, and unless it was saying in terms of integrated decision making as well across, across different areas too. Thanks, Paul. And, and Damien, if I can just bring you in here and then I'll, I'll ask uh, Jennifer and Peter, but uh, Damien, just in relation to the data issues and, and somebody had mentioned, you know, the resourcing of the CSO and, and obviously what, what data can be collected and, and Paul had mentioned data gaps earlier. Just in terms of the, the indicators that you have, um, are there ones that, uh, that you would like to have included, but the data just isn't there available or that element of decision making over the subjective and objective measures? Yes, I, I think so, Michelle. Um, I think that there is certainly no shortage of objective measures uh, from a data perspective. You know, that there's, there's plenty of data out there. And, uh, I mean, I suppose a limitation that we found when we were when we were um, creating the Wellbeing of the Nation release was that there was things maybe we would have liked to release, but there was only one data point. You know, one data point doesn't tell a story, you know, it doesn't, uh, and data can tell different stories depending on the interpretation of it as well, but like one data point on its own perhaps tells no story, you know, it doesn't tell a, an improvement or, or a disimprovement. Um, and there was some, um, there was some indicators that, that other countries uh, published that we had no data on at all. Um, so I think there are certainly data gaps and, and unfortunately uh, they seem to be more on the, the subjective side. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, but having said that, it's it's encouraging listening to Paul there that there, there are um, measurements of things like like poverty and at 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 um, be, statistics being collected on poverty. But I suppose it's it's joining all those up in um in a concerted manner, you know. And I mean that's that's why we a, a, a real drive that's being uh, pushed by the CSO at the moment is the development of a national data infrastructure, whereby you can you can join the person to where they work to where they live, you know, and, and I mean, if you have um, a number of identifiers to do that, it really helps in joining up data like this, you know, um, and that would include like a personal identifier, a work identifier and, uh, and a geographical identifier them for where they live. But um, that's that's early work, you know, we've, we've, we've made good strides in it, but there's still a lot of work to be done on that side. Yeah. Thanks for that, Damien. And yeah. Jennifer, I can just bring in here for just for a final comment from you before I ask uh, Peter. Grace, final comments. You just wanted to come in, in there. Yeah, I just wanted to come in um, and, and just um, because I think people, when they're talking about policy solutions, it can be helpful just to have a couple of examples. Um, so one of the um, examples from New Zealand um, was when they were looking at, you know, who's who's left behind, you know, who's getting missed out. Um, there were massive issues around um, domestic violence and the, the knock on effect really on that on people's well-being, families' well-being, but also on cost to the public purse. So they were able to then funnel, pull together money from different departments and funnel it into a program to try to specifically deal with that indicator and that's one of those gap spotting things that these kind of dashboards are really helpful for um and, and the environmental side um the, the kind of totemic um you know case was in wales where they used the legislation on well-being of future generations um to think differently about a motorway extension and then decided not to go ahead um with that because of the uh, the environmental costs um and all of the evidence, all of the normal policy evidence had been about economic benefits. Um, and as soon as he started looking at it from the perspective of social benefits, um, of which there were a limited number, um, and environmental costs, they came to a very different conclusion. So just to give you an idea of the sorts of, of changes that can get made when you start using this kind of framework, I thought that might be helpful. Okay, and, and, and just can I ask you, the question I was going to ask you was just in relation to one earlier about the, 
the ownership and development of a framework and you know and therefore making sure that it gets translated into policy making from the international experience uh, you know what are your thoughts on that about the, the ownership and translation of it yeah it's, it's really interesting usually they're started by an individual political leader um somebody who stakes their career on wanting to change the framing um of the way that decisions get made um so in scotland that was actually john swinney who's our deputy first minister um and has been our finance minister um obviously you all know uh jacinda adharan in, in uh, new zealand um who plays a similar role there um but then once the um you know sort of once the, the thrust of the argument has been won it becomes something that has to be owned by a cross section of society um, so we have a, um, a round table in Scotland that sits um, sort of at a, at a different level in the political structure um, to allow people to engage um, and to try and find ways around it that actually take it out of just the day to day politicking so that people can engage with that um, sort of long term agenda a little bit. Of course, in Wales, they have an office for future generations and that gives them an independent lens on it as well. So lots of options for how you can go um, in that. But the political leadership is absolutely critical at the outset. Okay, thank you very much for that, Jennifer. And, and finally, I might just ask, I turn to, to Peter for your final comments just in relation to your experience of Northern Ireland and your, um, I suppose, um, thoughts on, on the prospects of it, um, you know, uh, translating into uh, policy making in the future. Yes, well, an interesting uh, um, dimension of the, the conversation in uh, Northern Ireland was the, the way in which well being. Um, acted as a, a catalyst for cross-party engagement. Um, it provided a, a landing space for um, common uh, understandings, common concerns across the parties. And I, I believe that, that, that there's still a, um, a great potential for the, uh, th this narrative, this conversation to um, um, continue to provide a, a compelling piece of work for the parties to overcome some of the uh, the, the differences that usually inhibit um, their uh, their collaboration, especially around economic issues, they, they, they can be overdetermined by their ideologies. I just wanted to say one thing about the uh, the question of uh, um, where this is located. Now, I just want to underline the importance of leadership, um, the mobilization of constituencies and stakeholders. Um, and the importance of communication. Um, I was delighted that someone mentioned, you know, using um, new technology. But I think that uh, there's a role here for cultural and media actors as well to take the conversation out, to pose the question about where this is coming from. Why are we having the conversation? What is our response? How does Ireland inflect these global uh, shifts and demands on us to rethink the purpose of our economy and even the purpose of the corporation and business. And likewise, there's a, a demand for leadership and transformation on the inside, within the, in the machine, in the public sector, if you're to avoid the reproduction of fragmented thinking, because this is a catalyst, if anything, for systems thinking, holistic thinking. And that means new practices, new forms of training, new expectations about relationships, working relationships across the public sector, top and bottom. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that. And uh, I think the very um, insightful comment uh, to finish up our, our session on. Um, we only had an hour and a half for, for the seminar today, and, and clearly we, we could have been talking all day uh, about uh, well-being because it's so important to cross-section of society and, and issues. I want to thank all the panelists uh, very much on task behalf for their time in giving their expertise and knowledge in the well-being. And I'm sure we'll see them at form, similar forums again in the future on the topic. Thank you all very much to the audience for participating and I hope you found it useful. Um, I might remind people again just of next uh, task session on the 13th of November um, with the Labour MP uh, Paul Blomfield. Uh, thank you very much to everyone and please look at the task website for more information on task work. Thank you very much, everybody.